Milton, you know, you and I ha were just talking about alternative fuels, and they are such a hot topic right now. Everyone seems to be interested in them. In particular, you know, I've read and heard a lot about you know, electric vehicles, especially for, you know, trucking, uh, uh, class eight type vehicles, uh, and the, the differences between, say, hydrogen fuel cells and batteries. But I'd like to shift gears a little bit here and talk about ocean carriage and our alternative fuels for ocean carriage. And I know you have a lot of expertise in that. Um, I, I don't have as much expertise in that topic, uh, but I'm really curious about it. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, Melton, just spend a few minutes talking about you know, um, the current uh, fuels that are that are being used, and then the alternative fuels, and maybe the trade-offs uh, between them. Sure, happy to, Matt. Um, so, um, I mean, at the at the very highest level, let's start at fifty thousand feet and go down. Um, many mo many people agree with this. I'm. And if you if you disagree with it, feel free to disagree with me because uh, not everybody always does. But at the highest level, the way I see it is if you can electrify things, you do it. OK, we can green a grid eventually and we can um, use many different kinds of fuels to power the grid. Uh, we're using conventional fossil fuels now, but we're beginning to mix in some others. And in the long run, I think, uh, you know, we can get greener and greener. Uh, but and alternative fuels will play a role there, but not everything can be electrified. Okay, and you, um, you've talked about trucks, for example. There is a way to create, you know, electrified vehicles, um, but it's not absolutely clear that you that electrification is always the best way. You mentioned fuel cells, for example. So those are two alternative ways of, of when you have to have a mobile source of power. Uh, there's two alternatives. Um, but there are instances in which the grid and some of these mobile uh, some of these mobile fuels or power sources or energy sources are not well suited. One of them is in deep water shipping, and there's two problems there. One, you need an enormous amount of energy. Okay, enormous amounts of energy require enormous amounts of space. And one thing vessels don't have in abundance is space because they're vessels <laughs> uh, and they need their space for cargo. Uh, the other thing is uh, they have to uh, they have to carry their energy with them wherever they go. They can't just, you know, use a grid. Um, and so when you don't have that, you need some a fuel that is portable. Now, there are a large number, there are a number of candidates, all of them have technical and economic features. Um, people talk about hydrogen, people talk about ammonia in this area, people talk about methanol, and people talk about biofuels. Um, and the purpose of this is not to go take a deep dive into all of those, but basically in one, in this particular area, where the grid can't serve us well, and where space and other constraints require us to pay attention to the physical qualities of the fuel, um, some spe they have some special needs. So uh, one of the conclusions that I have come to in my most recent work is that um, hydrogen, although it's on many people's uh, wish list, shall we say, for as an alternative fuel, is not the best solution for deep water shipping because of, uh, let's call it, it's transportation challenges. It's very expensive to compress, to chill, and to transport. And even though it's a relatively easy to manufacture and inexpensive, uh, some of its uh, competitors like ammonia, methanol, uh, might be better suited for that sector. You know, when you, when you, Talk about hydrogen. Um, of course, hydrogen fuel cells are becoming. There's a lot of uh, interest um, in them in uh, over-the-road trucking. 
uh, as there is with batteries. Um, with, with hydrogen, you know, it takes uh, a lot of energy to remove the hydrogen from whatever it's bonded to to create the hydrogen fuel cells, which makes it a little less efficient in that regard. Um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, it's, it's counterintuitive a lot of times to the general public because they think, well, hydrogen's the most uh, abundant element in the universe. Why, why is this more expensive? Um, yeah. You know, that is, that is the popular perception, and it is correct, but it is also true that hydrogen does not uh, occur naturally anywhere. I mean, in, out in deep space, yes, but, but, but in this, on this planet, it has to be derived. And that's kind of the beginning of the problem. <laughs> um, uh, yes, there's a lot of it out there, but it, it, you know, there are, uh, there are actually natural sources of other, of other fuels. I mean, fossil fuels occur naturally, for example, uh, but hydrogen doesn't. So it requires a, man a production process. And it's, that's where the complications begin because uh, you get into production processes require energy. Um, then once what you produce has physical qualities like, you know, um, it, 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 uh, when it's a gas, when it's a liquid, when it's a solid and all of these things have to be dealt with. So, uh, by the way, let's not stop talking about hydrogen, though, just because I said that. Um, hydrogen has a lot of applications in marine transport, transportation, I believe, um, in fuel cells. But I'm making a slight distinction here between deep water shipping, which is the kind of shipping that that, that big old container uh, ship, uh, you know, that blocked the Suez Canal recently uh, was, and let's say ferries that take people from, uh, you know, through the North Sea between Scandinavian cities. Um, fuel cells, um, hydrogen fuel cells might very well be a very good solution for those kinds of uh, intracoastal uh, vessels. But the ones that travel, you know, thousands of miles per on a trip uh, and are very large might need a different solution. So for, for, for deep water, one example you gave was hydro, uh, ammonia. And um, <clears throat> have there been, are there any prototypes out there at this point that are using um, ammonia? Well, this might actually be good information for um, the, those listening. Um, it is probably fair to say that in the uh, in the alternative uh, fuel area, if you leave hydrogen aside for a moment um, for deep water, uh, basically the problem with hydrogen is it's so expensive, it takes up so much space, there'll hardly be any room for the cargo if you try to, you know, power uh, a deep a deep ocean vessel with hydrogen. Um, but of the remaining candidates. Um, Two of them actually are moving into commercialization. They're past the prototype stage. One is ammonia and one is methanol. Um, there is a biofuel generation that's still in the lab that's coming out that does not uh, compete with food supplies or, or require the destruction of carbon sinks. Uh, but it's a little bit further out in terms of its development. And it, it would be in the prototype stage. Um, but um, no, the largest carriers, uh, Maersk, uh, has uh, com is already on record as planning to launch a methanol-fueled uh, vessel uh, in the next two years and an ammonia-fueled uh, vessel a little bit further out. So um, they're really moving from prototype to commercialization. I would say full commercialization is still one or two years out it takes a while to build these things um but yeah that's where it is so how does the cost compare i know technologies get better as you go through time um, things become less expensive but currently what's the differential say between methanol and um, fossil fuels for deep ocean uh well look um 
that's a complicated question, uh, which I can, um, let, let, let's put it this way, given that our time constraints, let me not try to answer that question fully. I don't want to dodge it, but um, let me just say that it's not a simple matter of looking at the price of methanol today, uh, which on an energy equivalent basis is about twice as much as the standard residual fuel used in a in a container sh ship uh, let's call it ifo 380 which is the a medium grade residual fuel um, it has high sulfur it has all kinds of things in it that are not fully compliant with uh, a lot of environmental regulations but it is widely used so methanol if you decided you wanted to do it would cost you twice as much but um, the issues here have to do with regulations you can't you can't take ships that emit so much sulfur into certain parts of the world. Um, you can't get into certain ports with it. You have to have a, a sulfur compliant uh, fuel. So uh, then there's the issue of propulsion systems. Uh, and the uh, diesels that burn IFO 380 don't just burn methanol, they have to be redesigned. And that goes for ammonia and it goes for others as well. And then finally, there's the bunkering and infrastructure. There's plenty of IFO 380 in the world. There's hardly any methanol in the world. In fact, uh, there was an article just this week about the Maersk, uh, the, 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 the first Maersk methanol fueled uh, tanker is not certain they can secure enough methanol <laughs> given the supply in the world to, uh, to fuel it all the time. And fortunately it's a dual fuel design so they can they can back down to a to a to a diesel fuel, but so the issue is complicated by the availability, the propulsion systems, and these things all have to evolve more or less at the same time. Um, so that's an interesting concept there. Um, so if you had a container ship, say, that had, you know, maybe some methanol and um, some IFO 380, would you need two different propulsion systems? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It gets, uh, it gets tricky. That's just it. Um, and all of the infrastructure, you know, we're really not talking about fuels in the, in the, in the real world. We're talking about propulsion systems and we're talking about designs. Um, uh, the IMO regulations that people uh, talk about in this area are not simply regulations about how much emissions that the fuel itself is allowed to, you know, release into the atmosphere, but there are also regulations having to do with the design of the vessel. And um, vessels need to be designed in other ways to make them more efficient to meet the regulations. Um, so there's this complicated business of fuels and design and retrofitting uh, existing vessels versus building new vessels. Uh, when the sulfur uh, regulations went into effect on January 1st, 2020, a lot, of, a lot of ship owners decided to retrofit. And that was a viable option at the time because you could install scrubbers on an existing uh, vessel and you could meet the the sulfur emissions regulations by doing that. Within about eight or nine months, people were kind of unhappy with that decision because of what had happened to prices made the made the retrofits uh, unattractive, shall we say. So people who had committed to them were now saddled with expenses that they, you know, didn't need to, investments they didn't need to make. And so but other things you can't retrofit. You have to change the entire propulsion system in order to uh, move, say, from IFO to methanol or to ammonia. Which is more abundant, ammonia or methanol? Oh, well, one of the reasons that ammonia kind of edges out some of the candidates is that it's ubiquitous. So ammonia is one of the most widely used industrial chemicals in the world. It's used to manufacture fertilizer and fertilizer of course is used everywhere um, there are about 170 million metric tons of it manufactured a year um, methanol is also an industrial uh, chemical but it, oh by the way ammonia is also traded in over uh, almost 200 ports around the world well those are the same ports that the shipping uses of course 
Methanol is also a, a, an industrial chemical, but not as widely used. Only, uh, um, uh, only a couple hundred thousand metric tons of methanol is manufactured every year. And so, and it's used in very specific places for certain industrial purposes. And it's not ubiquitous, it's not all the way around the world. So in order to build a world that is that where you could fill up your tank with methanol would require a lot of time and investment. To do the same thing with ammonia wouldn't quite require nearly as much time and investment. And that's where, you know, that's where sometimes you get the commercial edge. Uh, well, look, the, the tanks are already there. The people who know how to safely handle ammonia are already trained. Uh, the ports already have, have supplies. Yes, we have to make some slight modifications, but the time that will be required and the investment required is much, much less with some options versus others. How about the space required for enough fuel to go um, from one port to the next around the world? Uh, if you compare IFO 380 to ammonia, yeah, I'm sure that's a complicated question, but no, it's, you know, it, the first time I was asked the question, it was complicated because I couldn't do it in my head. But I've been asked the question now so many times. Um, I know it. There's first of all, there's no fossil fuel on the planet that isn't considerably more energy dense than a non fossil fuel. All right. So if we're going to give up carbon, I mean, if that's what you're thinking, we are going to have less lower density fuels. Um, so what is that? What is the practical implication of that? It means that basically your gas tank needs to be twice as large as it used to be. Um, and it will be even larger if you choose a fuel like hydrogen because the, um, um, and uh, it'll be slightly larger more than that if you choose methanol. Um, so everybody, all of them have an energy density level. But if you're trying to compare you know, one of these, let's call them uh, uh, alternative fuels to a fossil fuel, you're always going to have lower energy density. The reason to move to these alternative fuels has to do with the environmental benefits, um, not because they're naturally more, you know, they're more attractive economically to the, to the, to the users. How about the, um, the size and weight of the propulsion systems, say for uh, IFO 380 versus ammonia? Yeah, um, it kind of depends on what kind of propulsion system you're talking about. So a, a D, let's call it, let's just, an internal combustion engine will burn uh, residual fuel. It'll reserve, it'll burn distillates like marine gas. It will burn hydrogen. It will burn ammonia. It will burn methanol. You can build an internal combustion engine to burn almost anything. And they have to be modified. LPG, LNG, all of these files, fuels require a different, you know, slightly different designs to work, but they work fine. Um, the maintenance of an internal combustion engine is about the same from one fuel to the next. I mean, I'm sure that somebody who really maintains them would disagree with me slightly on that, but but in, in gross terms, they're about the same. When you go to electric propulsion, your maintenance and operating costs drop dramatically. Uh, you know, maintaining electric motors are a very well understood technology. They're very reliable. They work for long periods of time. They require very little maintenance. Um, uh, by the way, I saw an interesting quote from a, um, it was a female trucker. And she said, one of the things she likes so much about the electric uh, trucks is they're so much easier to run, to, to, to operate. <laughs> and as a, as a female trucker, she said, that's, that's highly desirable. <laughs> well, you know, um, they, they have so much more torque, so. Well, there are all kinds yeah. of things. You were, you know, that all the gears, I mean, you, 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 if you've been in logistics, you've been in one of these things when they're, when they're, uh, you know, starting up, uh, it's a lot of complicated equipment required to make a, a diesel engine pull a large load and electric electric uh, propulsion systems by comparison are quite uh, much simpler. Um, so, by the way, this has been proven in the uh, in just in the automobile sector. Um, the, the cost of operating a Tesla is a, a fraction of the cost of operating a comparably uh, equipped uh, internal combustion engine. Uh, so. Um, yeah, you will. You, 
you will if you if you move from internal combustion engines to other type fuel cells uh, running electric propulsion systems, you're going to have some different economics. You're right. Uh, the problem with fuel cells and batteries is that they don't hold enough. Their energy density is the least of all. Okay, the lowest energy density is in a battery. Um, the car, the ever given, would have to be filled with batteries and no cargo in order to take a trip that it normally takes. That's how many batteries in, in rough terms it takes to, to, to run something that large. So as, you, as your energy density gets less and less, your cargo carrying capacity gets less and less too. So um, there's a sweet spot. It, it sounds, you know, this is just a short discussion. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground in a short period of time. Um, but it sounds like from what you're saying, maybe for uh, deep water, uh, ammonia might have uh, the, the edge on this. Is that correct? Well, they're all running hard, I'd say. I'd say um, one, of, some, one of my colleagues uh, has far many more years of experience with ammonia specifically. He's the executive director of the Ammonia Energy Association has been doing it's been following the research in this area for 20 years. Um, and um, if you really wanted to drill into ammonia deeply, uh, I'll connect you with uh, Trevor because he's exceedingly knowledgeable in this area. But basically he would say, there's a race going on right now. And ammonia is running very well <laughs> in the race, but it's a long, it's a, it's a long term, it's a long race. It's not a sprint. And uh, right now, uh, by the way, just to give you an idea of how this has changed, in, in, in 2020, I believe the total, um, the, the total capacity of all new ammonia production, and this would be green ammonia production, the kind that will be suitable for shipping in the 2040 to 2050 range, was about the total announced production capacity was about 10 megawatts. Um, at the end of 2020, a 300 gigawatt production capacity uh, plant in Asia had been announced. And those are, those are serious orders of magnitude difference. Um, this is one of the reasons I say that this, these, uh, these particular uh, fuels uh, hydrogen and ammonia, by the way, I, you make ammonia by making hydrogen, by the way. So if you're making ammonia, you could be making hydrogen. It just depends on what form you need it in for your end user. And places that make one will be making the other just because that's the way it's made. So when I think of making hydrogen, I, you know, you could make the hydrogen into ammonia uh, for your, for the benefit of your audience, uh, an ammonia, uh, a hydrogen atom has two a hydrogen molecule has two atoms of hydrogen. An ammonia molecule has three atoms of hydrogen. You can actually carry more hydrogen in an ammonia molecule than you can in a hydrogen molecule. So um, this is ramping up very, very quickly. Uh, it's going commercial scale. And uh, I think, um, I don't think there's going to be a winner winner. There's going to be uh, winners. Uh, that are going to emerge. And for different use cases, uh, hydrogen will be the best fuel. Uh, uh, by the way, the, 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 the Japanese, just to put this into a larger perspective, have uh, banned nuclear power generation, as you may have read when they, uh, after those tsunamis. Um, they have now invented uh, a micro turbines, which could be scaled up to utility scale turbines that run on hydrogen and ammonia. So hydrogen and ammonia may become the fuel of choice for even electric grids. Um, uh, and so um, it's hard to say who wins in a scenario like this. It's, it's more like, well, the power sector might prefer to use one and the deep water shipping might prefer to use another, and the intracoastal shipping uh, might use a third, and the, and the trucking and the drayage uh, 
folks, they will use a fourth. And so that's more or less the way it's probably going to settle out. It seems to be shaking out that way in all of the transportation sectors. Milton, thank you so much for sharing your expertise uh, on this. Uh, it's been very interesting. I appreciate it. My pleasure, Matt.